This video is to help you complete your notes on chapter 4.1, which is species, communities, and ecosystems, and the first couple parts of your litter lab. So way back in the 80s, um, in the Pacific Northwest, there was this really beautiful, perfectly symmetrical mountain called Mount St. Helens. Um, only this wasn't really an ordinary mountain. It happened to be a volcano. And one day, out of the middle of nowhere, it seemed, this volcano had a massive eruption. And it wasn't necessarily like the big lava spewing eruption that you would think uh, that you'd see based on like movies, but it was basically a big cloud of extremely hot, extremely powerful ash. And this ash completely decimated these ecosystems that were present on and near the mountain. So basically just decimating, just killing off everything, every plant, every mushroom, every animal uh, within its path. So what was really interesting to see is the transformation between these very mature ecosystems to something that was totally barren of life, yet within only a short couple of months, certain shrub-like plants and other animals started to appear. And it just shows us how cyclic these ecosystems are, that they begin with small, like, primary uh, plants, animals, bacteria, fungi, and then they mature, and then some kind of event disrupts them, and they start the cycle all over again. So throughout our chapter on ecology, we're going to be using some terminology like ecosystem, species, population, and some other words um, pretty frequently, and it's important that we understand exactly what these words mean. So let's talk species. A species is a group of organisms that can interbreed, there's the important part there, and produce fertile offspring, okay? So in other words... Okay, two individuals, if they can breed together and if their offspring can also breed on its own, they must be of the same species. Okay, so dogs are actually all of the same species. They may look really different. They may be different sizes, have different shapes, fur colors, etc. Okay, but all dogs can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Now, Members of the same species usually have some common uh, physical characteristics. So all dogs have four legs, and they have two ears, and they have furry coats, they have a tail, etc. Members of the same species usually, actually, according to our definition, always have the inter ability to interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Members of a species have gene pools that are different than other organisms. So dogs all have a very similar gene pool, but their gene pool is very different than a cat. Okay, so they have gene pools that are different. And they have a common phylogeny. We're going to talk a lot more about phylogeny when we get into evolution. But basically it means they have the same family tree. So all the current species, not species, sorry, all the current breeds of dogs can actually be traced back to a common ancestor. And so these common species, or this one species with the different breeds, all came from the same common ancestor. Now, of course, this is biology. There are very few rules that don't have an exception, and this is kind of one of those weird exceptions. So our idea of a species are things that can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Now, what's interesting about this is that there are some species that can interbreed, okay? They just can't produce fertile offspring. So that kind of challenges our definition a little bit of what a species is. For example, a horse and a zebra can reproduce to make a zorse. Yeah, that's real. Um, and so even though their offspring can't uh, reproduce on its own, they can still make offspring. So that's, you know, I wonder if that's eventually going to challenge our definition of what, a, what a species is. Now, how come they can do this? Well, I can't mate a zebra and a hippopotamus because they're not very closely related. Their chromosomes are very different. The genes for those uh, certain traits, really important traits, are going to be found at different spots along those chromosomes. So they're not going to talk right. 
Okay, so in order to make something like this, I've got to have something that's already closely related. Now, how come if they're so closely related that they can reproduce that their offspring is infertile? Well, it just so happens that horses and zebras have different numbers of chromosomes. Remember, that's a defining characteristic of an organism sometimes. And... Um, that causes their sex chromosomes and some other ones to really not interact properly to be able to produce fertile offspring. Okay, so some members of the same species don't interbreed at all, okay? And that's not because they're unable to or because they uh, can't produce fertile offspring. And maybe they're just separated by long distances. We're going to talk more about that later. Now, if we're defining a species as something that can interbreed, what about organisms that don't need to interbreed, like asexual reproducers, like bacteria? How do I tell one species of bacteria apart from another one? I can't make them breed together to see if it works. They're asexual reproducers. And now we're getting into some really cool things um, with infertility. You know, some individuals are just infertile. And with technology like IVF um, becoming more and more of an option to explore the scientific capabilities there, I wonder if eventually we're going to have to come up with another definition of species, okay? Now, like the Zorse, uh, there are some other hybrids that we can actually make. Hybrids are the offspring of two similar but different species. So again, not two breeds of dogs, or the same species, but different species. Now, because they're different species, their offspring are going to be infertile, meaning once I make a hybrid, this hybrid can't mate with another hybrid and have a second generation of hybrids. It's not possible. Okay, so it's probably likely that this is not going to exist in nature. Okay, I don't see why this and this would see themselves in nature and think, yes, I can reproduce with you. And even if they did do that, their offspring can't reproduce on their own anyways. All right, but some common examples, again, the Zorse, which is made from a horse and a donkey. Sorry, here's a Zorse. Um, a mule, which we see a lot around here in Amish country, is the offspring of a female horse and a male donkey. And ligers. Yes, ligers are real, okay? And that is the offspring of a female tiger and a male lion. Okay, so let's talk about these different species. So we said a horse and a donkey are different species. Well, how do different species come to be? Well, they come to be different species when they can no longer interbreed. Why wouldn't they be interbreeding? Well, one of those reasons could be because they have come to occupy very different parts of the environment. So, for example, if uh, they are living in the same area and that area gets separated by a canyon, or if some group of that original population migrates to a different island, or if a river floods and it separates two groups and so here's my river, here are my two groups of organisms and usually they're able to crisscross and go and breed with each other. If this river floods and they're not able to cross it anymore, now I have two different groups of the population that are separated. Same thing can happen with volcanic eruptions, a whole host of things. If they become separated for long enough periods of a time, they might evolve differently. Maybe this environment becomes slightly different than this one. And so this environment favors some traits while this favors different traits. That's going to cause them to evolve in different directions. After really long periods of time, they may not be able to reproduce anymore. Even if you were to remove this geographical barrier, if they've evolved separately enough, they're not going to be able to reproduce anymore. And that's the case here with the antelope squirrels. So the antelope squirrel used to live uh, in an area now occupied by the Grand Canyon. And when they were became separated by the canyon many millions of years ago and weren't able to cross from the North Rim to the South Rim anymore, okay, they started to develop slightly different features because their habitats became slightly different. And those different habitats 
uh, favored some traits over the others. So we can see slight changes in their tails. We have a white tail and a black tail and in their fur color, etc. So here they were separated by a geographic barrier. They evolved separately and now they're no longer able to breed and this is why we consider them different species. Again, even if we were to put this one and this one in the same area, they wouldn't be able to create fertile offspring with each other. Okay, if I were going to separate all of the organisms on Earth, I could do that in a bunch of different ways. Um, one way that we've talked about before is you could separate prokaryotes into eukaryotes. And so then if you're doing that, you're separating them based on their morphology. Do they have a nucleus and organelles? Do they not have that? I could also separate organisms based, by, based on their what we call mode of nutrition. So how do they get the things that they need? All right, well, if I'm separating them that way, then I'm going to be separating them into what's called autotrophs and heterotrophs. Troph meaning to feed or to eat. Okay, auto meaning self. These are what we call self feeders. Okay, they don't eat themselves, they make their own food by themselves. Hetero means different. So these organisms have to eat different organisms, they're feeding on other organisms. So here's the information that you need for a nice T chart comparing autotrophs and heterotrophs. Okay, so autotrophs can synthesize organic molecules. So synthesize meaning to make organic molecules, like let's say glucose, from inorganic molecules. And this is usually going to happen through the process of photosynthesis. Okay, now they're also called producers because they make food that is used by other organisms. And these are things like plants, algae, and some bacteria. So they take inorganic molecules like the carbon dioxide in the air and water, and through the process of photosynthesis, turn that into organic molecules like glucose. That's super different than heterotrophs. Heterotrophs have to what we call ingest or eat their food, okay? So that means that they have to obtain their organic molecules from other organisms. We also call them consumers. So we have producers and we have consumers. And these are things like animals, fungi, uh, some bacteria are like this. Okay, so this is actually the leaf cutter ant. Leaf cutter ants are super cool. Leaf cutter ants don't actually eat the leaves. Their digestive systems can't do that. So they kind of chew up the leaves, and in their saliva uh, is, are some chemicals that make it really enticing for mold to grow on these leaves. So mold grows on the chewed up leaves, and then the ants eat the mold. It's pretty cool. So ants and fungi, in that case, would both be heterotrophs. The, the fungi would be eating the leaf, and the ant eats the fungi. Okay, so we have a producer, and then a consumer. Okay, so consumers are exactly what they sound like. They have to consume or eat things. And again, the other word for that is ingesting. So a couple of ways that you can do this, you can actually eat producers. You can eat fruits and vegetables or the actual plant. You may also be eating a product of a producer, okay, like fruit juice, something like that. We can also eat other heterotrophs. So I can eat this chicken. This chicken is a heterotroph. It eats things to survive. I can eat this chicken. Or I can eat the products of the chicken, like the eggs. So consuming things takes on a whole uh, lot of different ways that you could achieve that. There are a ton of different types of consumers. We could talk about herbivores, which eat plants, or carnivores, which eat animals, or omnivores, which eat plants and animals. We're really only going to, right now, focus on two types of consumers, and we're going to focus on them because this chapter is a lead-in to our next chapter on how things get recycled. And so there's two really important types of consumers that recycle things. One of them is called a detritivore, and they eat detritus. 
What the heck is detritus? Well, detritus is any non-living organic matter, and that can be things like dead leaves. So they have organic molecules in them, glucose, cellulose, etc., but they're not living. They can eat feces. Yes, we must have things that eat feces. If nothing ate feces, then the whole world would just be filled with big piles of feces, and that doesn't sound very nice. And carcasses, which are dead bodies. So examples of detritivores include things like earthworms, dung beetles, okay, some other insects that live in the ground. Those are detritivores. The other really important type of consumer that's involved with recycling is what we call a saprotroph. Saprotrophs are super cool. They actually digest your, their food externally. So what does that mean? Well, let's take a look at a human. Okay, humans eat their food. The food goes through their digestive system where they absorb all the nutrients and then it comes out. Okay, but the digestion actually happens on the inside. Saprotrophs work a little bit differently. Okay, the most common examples that we're familiar with are mushrooms and other types of molds, yeast, etc. They don't actually eat anything. Notice that they're not green. They're not plants. They are not autotrophs. They have these really cool things called hyphae. We are usually not seeing them. And these hyphae will find something that they want to digest. They will kind of secrete these digestive juices onto whatever they want to digest. It's going to become a globby, gooey mess, okay? It's actually getting digested or broken down on the outside of the body. And then it will reabsorb those already digested nutrients. So they secrete digestive enzymes and do their digesting on the outside of their bodies. We also call these decomposers. Uh, these can include, again, fungi, a lot of different types of bacteria. And they're super important because if it weren't for them, we would just have a bunch of dead things laying around and no way to recycle them. So these are our recyclers. When something is dead, okay, those nutrients that are stuck in the dead things get released and recycled by the sapr saprotrophs and the detritivores. Now, what makes a saprotroph and detritivore different is that the detritivores are still internal digesters. Earthworms and beetles still have a digestive tract, and they're still doing that on the inside. Okay, saprotrophs are achieving the same thing, but again, they are external digesters. Next up are, again, some of those words that we tend to easily confuse, okay? So we said a species is a group of organisms that can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. If I have a group of the same species living in the same area, we call that a population, okay? So if I have a group of dung beetles all living in my backyard and they're interacting together... Okay, then I would call them a population. They're of the same species. They're living in the same place at the same time. A community is a bunch of different populations, so groups of different species living in and interacting with each other in the same area. So here I've got an example of a coral reef. This is actually an ecosystem, but we can talk about the community, Okay, the different populations in here. So I see this type of fish... Okay, I see this type of fish. I see coral, which is actually an animal. I see these fish. Okay, so obviously I've got several individuals of the same species living in the same area at the same time. So these are called angelfish. I see a population of angelfish. Okay, these fish are called parrotfish. Okay, and I don't know if I see any more in here. Okay, but these parrotfish are the same species living in the same area at the same time. So community of angelfish community of parrotfish. Since I have different, sorry, population of angelfish, population of parrotfish, since I have populations that are different species living in the same area at the same time, we call that a community, okay? So why did I say that that picture was actually a picture of an ecosystem? 
Well, because in that picture, I could see both living things, like the coral and the fish, and non-living things, like the water. So the combination of all of the biotic, which means living, and abiotic, which means non-living, factors in a given area is what we call an ecosystem. Okay, so again, here's a picture of a prairie ecosystem. I see living things like grass and bison, and I'm sure there's some living things in here that I can't see, like bacteria and fungus and all kinds of stuff and ticks and bugs that are on these big smelly guys, probably dung beetles in here too. And then I see non-living things. I see rocks. I see clouds. There's moisture in the air. Okay, all of those things together, the living and non-living parts make up an ecosystem. So in that picture of the prairie ecosystem, again, those grasses um, are examples of an abiotic, no, sorry, biotic factor. They're living. And again, those are autotrophs. Plants are autotrophs. They make their own food. They get their nutrients from photosynthesis. And because of that, they are also called producers. They produce all of the food in the food chain. Okay, so this fox gets its organic molecules, its vitamins, its energy, everything from the food that it eats. And this food gets its food from producers. No matter what food chain you're talking about, okay, you can always trace it back to producers or autotrophs, and they're using the process of photosynthesis. So on the next slide, let's go ahead and do some review of photosynthesis. Okay, photosynthesis, making things using light. Okay, so first we should know the formulas for this. Okay, we have water plus carbon dioxide gives you glucose and oxygen. Okay, so now's a good time to kind of pause, make sure that you know how to write that in words and in chemical symbols. If I'm looking at a plant, okay, the parts of the plant, okay, so here are the roots, we have the stem, we have a leaf or two, here are leaves, and maybe if this is a flowering plant, we have a flower. Well, photosynthesis relies on the pigment chlorophyll, Chlorophyll is green. Its job is to absorb light. So the part of the plants that are doing photosynthesis are usually the part of the plant that are, you guessed it, green. Okay? So we're talking like the leaves, usually maybe the stems a little bit. Okay. So let's go back then and talk about these leaf cells. Okay? Plant cells have a cell wall surrounded by a cell membrane, they've got a nucleus, they've got the Golgi, they've got the ER, the rough ER, the smooth ER, they've got ribosomes, they've got mitochondria, they've got a big central vacuole to hold all that water, and then they have a bunch of the structures where photosynthesis happens called chloroplasts. Okay, so photosynthesis happens in the chloroplast. You probably already know that. And let's go ahead and draw a diagram of photosynthesis. Okay, so here's my chloroplasts. And chloroplasts have a couple different parts. They have these stacks of discs called thylakoids. Okay, and these thylakoids are green. That's where all the uh, chlorophyll is located. And then they have this clear jelly stuff called the stroma. And photosynthesis happens in two distinct steps. We have the light-dependent reaction. And then we have the light-independent reaction, also known as the Calvin cycle. You should probably know both. Not Calvin, Calvin. Calvin cycle. All right. 
So let's outline the steps of photosynthesis. These thylakoids are green. They contain the pigment chlorophyll, and the job of chlorophyll is to absorb light. In those cases, this is going to come from the sun. We're going to use the energy from that light to do two things. One of them is to take a water molecule and split it. When you split a water molecule, it's going to split into hydrogens and oxygens. The oxygens aren't necessary, not in that number, so the plant gives them off as molecular oxygen, oxygen gas. And that's where these guys are coming from. So we used up water, we produced oxygen. So what happens to these hydrogens? Well, these hydrogens have to get over to the stroma, but in order to do that, they need a carrier molecule called NADP+. NADP plus goes to the thylakoid, it picks up that hydrogen, and it becomes NADPH. Okay, so the first thing we do with the energy from the sun is we use that energy to split a water molecule. The second thing that we do is we use that energy to recharge ADP into ATP. Now, if you're in higher level, you know that that's actually a lot more complicated than I'm making it sound. And if you're not in higher level, you can look forward to that next year. Okay, but ADP gets recharged into ATP, and that is the light-dependent reaction. In the light-independent reaction, the plant is going to absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So if my goal is to make glucose, I have the C's. I have the O's, and the H's are going to come from NADPH, which originally came from water. Okay, so I'm going to send that NADPH over here. I'm going to steal the H's, and it becomes NADP plus again. So I'm ready to make glucose. And in order to do that, to create those high energy bonds, I've got to use that energy from ATP. So we're going to use the energy from ATP to create these high energy bonds, and then ATP come, becomes ADP again. And that is the light independent reaction. So you'll notice how photosynthesis uh, tends to be kind of a cycle. Okay, we see that within the chloroplast, and then uh, photosynthesis forms a cycle with cellular respiration. Okay, what's produced in cellular respiration is needed by photosynthesis, and what's produced by photosynthesis is needed in cellular respiration. And so we find one of the great examples of what we call nutrient cycling. See, the Earth is a closed system. Yeah, every now and then space dust, meteorites, something falls to Earth. But for the most part, whatever matter we have on Earth is all we have. We're not getting any new matter. Okay, so whatever we have on Earth has to be recycled, okay? So consumed, used for something, and then recycled because we're not getting any new stuff. So for that reason, we say that nutrients are recycled. It's a little bit different than energy, okay? We have a constant influx of energy from the sun in the terms or in the forms of light and heat and other forms of energy. Okay, so that energy comes in it's converted from solar energy to chemical energy by plants, okay, which is converted into chemical energy in the form of ATP and heat by consumers. And then that heat is then lost through the Earth's atmosphere. But that's okay that that heat is lost because new energy is coming in from the sun. So for that reason, we say that energy flows through an ecosystem, but nutrients are cycled. We're not getting any new nutrients Okay, the nutrients and matter that are uh, present on Earth okay, uh, have to get recycled. One of the really important features of this nutrient cycling are what we call decomposers. So again, decomposers are going to include the saprotrophs like fungi, mushrooms, some bacteria, and the detritivores like the earthworms, beetles, uh, lots of other things. And they unlock nutrients that are otherwise stuck in the dead bodies of organisms. If it weren't for these guys, the earth would be just filled with stacks of dead bodies. And they do that in one of two ways. The first thing they do is pretty cool. Their digestive enzymes convert the organic matter 
into a form that's more useful for other organisms. So for example, in the soil is a bunch of what we call nitrogen fixing bacteria. And they help take proteins from dead organisms and they help turn them into nitrates which the plants can use. They can also use other forms, but they work with the dead organisms also. And then they also turn nutrients into components of soil. So these dead leaves, for example, have nutrients locked in them. Decomposers and saprotrophs and detritivores will take those nutrients, digest them, and then those digested nutrients return to the soil, which then new plants use to grow. So a great example of how decomposers are a very important part of that nutrient cycling. So how does this nutrient cycling exactly take place? Well, it's going to be a series of steps here. Okay, so step number one, producers like plants, algae, certain types of bacteria are going to take inorganic compounds like carbon dioxide or water and transform them into organic compounds like glucose. Okay, so the goal is to go from inorganic to organic. Now, they can take that glucose and use it for something, or they can hook those little monomers of glucose together. So remember, glucose looks like this. They can bond them together to make all sorts of things. Okay, if they need, if plants need to make a structure like their cell wall, they're gonna take glucoses and turn them into cellulose, all these little glucose molecules hooked together. Notice how that's a straight line, straight line, straight line, straight line. If they need to store these glucoses for energy, they can turn them into starch. So here are all my little glucose molecules, okay? And starch or amylopectin is a spiral. Those are what producers do. Glycogen is for animal cells, so we're not really going to get into that too much here. Okay, so after the producers produce the organic molecules, then the consumers are going to eat the producers. So I see plants in here producing things. I'm sure there are snails, insects, whatever in here eating the producers. The complex molecules found in the producers are digested into smaller monomers, such as glucose and amino acids. So if in the plant there are, in fact, a bunch of, let's say, starch molecules, okay, then the consumer, and you would be an example of this, is going to digest those large molecules and break them down into smaller components. Now, those smaller components can be used for a variety of things, energy, structures, etc. And when those consumers die, their cells are broken down by the digestive enzymes of decomposers, and these nutrients are then returned back to the soil. And so this is what we call the big circle of life here. You can go ahead and cue that Lion King music in your head. Okay, so we go from inorganic molecules to producers to consumers. Consumers die, they're decomposed, and we start those cycles over again. And that is what we call nutrient cycling. Here's an example of a closed environment, a closed ecosystem that has been going for, I think, almost 50 years or something like that. It's been a long time. Okay, it's a self-sustaining environment, much like the Earth. Okay, where the nutrients that are in here now were present in here when this uh, ecosystem was built, and they just keep getting recycled. So what kind of nutrients need to be recycled? Well, all of them. Okay, some common ones that you might be familiar with, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, even the water cycle is an example of a nutrient cycling. Now, we're going to be taking a closer look at the nitrogen cycle. Just to review, nitrogen is really important in a couple of biomolecules. Okay, so we have four biomolecules. We have carbohydrates, we have lipids, we have proteins, and we have nucleic acids. Okay, these two both contain nitrogen. So without nitrogen, 
we could probably make carbs, we could probably make lipids, but we couldn't make proteins or nucleic acids. So let's take a look at that nitrogen cycle. We're going to be in two spots in our nitrogen cycle. So I'm just going to kind of cut my space in half. And we're going to say that down here represents the soil. And up here represents the atmosphere. Okay. Now, present in the atmosphere is a bunch of molecular nitrogen, so nitrogen gas. In fact, 70-something percent of our atmosphere is made up of nitrogen, so it's mostly nitrogen. And we need nitrogen, so that's a good thing. The only problem is that plants, animals, most organisms can't use the nitrogen that's in the air. So we rely on a bacterium found in the soil. And this is what we call nitrogen fixing bacteria. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna take this nitrogen and they're going to fix it, which means that they're going to convert it into nitrates. So it makes it a little bit chemically different. And this is just enough to allow for things like plants and plant roots to absorb them. So the plant roots, okay, absorb the nitrates and those nitrates are again used to build things like proteins, nucleic acids, etc. So let's say that this tree produces an apple, okay? And that a human comes along and eats the apple, okay? Then that nitrate, okay, or nitrogen, has now gone from the atmosphere into the soil. The bacteria turned it into a nitrate. The nitrates became part of the plant and those nitrates became transferred to the human when the human ate part of the plant. When the human either dies or poops or pees, this waste is excreted, okay? Let's assume we're not talking about death. Let's assume we're talking about waste. Okay, this waste then eventually makes it back into the soil where another type of bacteria is then going to turn that back into atmospheric nitrogen. And so here we have the, nitric, or the nitrogen cycle. Atmospheric nitrogen being converted to nitrates by nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Nitrates become part of plants. Plants become part of consumers. Consumers produce waste or they die and the bacteria will decompose that waste and return those nutrients back to the atmosphere. So if you're planning on creating any kind of an ecosystem where you need a self-sustaining ecosystem, I would definitely plan on including some nitrogen fixing bacteria or just bacteria in general because their properties as decomposers and fixers definitely make them uh, essential. One of the great things about ecology is getting outside and taking a look at uh, what kind of things we can collect data on, what kind of assumptions and conclusions can we make, and we're gonna be doing that next week. But it is impossible to count the entire number of individuals in an area exactly if we're talking about a large area. So let's say I wanted to count the number of dandelions growing on an old baseball field. Even just in this picture, I doubt if I could count all of them without making a mistake, okay? And it would take me forever. And imagine if I had to do that for a whole baseball field. So how do we estimate how many dandelions are on a baseball field without actually calculating all of them or counting all of them. Well, we're going to estimate ecological data the same way that presidential polls are put together. So let's take a look at this poll. I think this one's from way back in June. Yeah, there we go, June of this year. So on June 26th through 28th, 
Okay, 59% of people said that they were voting for Hillary Clinton, and 34% said that they were voting for Donald Trump. Well, no one called me to ask me who I was voting for. No one called anybody that I know. So how do these pollsters know for sure that 59% of people are going to vote for Hillary and 34 for Trump if they didn't ask anybody? Well, what they did is they found a representative sample. Okay, so these numbers represent the percentages of the sample that they actually asked these poll questions. And what these poll takers rely on is that the sample is representative of the general population. And so how do you do that? Well, you got to call a lot of people and you got to hope that your calling is random enough to where your sample is likely to match your general population. Well, how do we do that in ecology? Well, we're going to be taking samples from random parts using what we call a quadrat. Quad meaning four. Here's a quadrat. It's got four sides, and each side measures one meter. So one meter, one meter, one meter, one meter. What you're going to do is you're going to lay this sucker down uh, a bunch of time in random spots on whatever you want to measure. So here we're measuring the number of dandelions in a baseball field. So if you lay this down, count the number of dandelions in here, and then lay it down somewhere else in your field, and you do that in enough time, you'll be conducting uh, a random sample, which is the same principle as presidential polling. We've now reached the end of the notes portion of 4.1. Um, the rest of this video is going to cover some review questions that you're going to find helpful and then an introduction to a lab you're going to be doing uh, later next week. So how do we do these review questions? Well, the best way to do it is to pause the video, give yourself a chance to answer, and then resume the video to see the answer. So what term refers to a community and its abiotic environment? So again, now would be a good time to pause that. A community is all the living organisms, like all the different populations, and the abiotic environment together they make up the ecosystem. Which organisms externally digest dead organic matter and then absorb the nutrients? Pause now, answer. If you said saprotrophs, you would be right. Very nice. They externally digest things. Consider the simple food web below. Which organism could be a saprotroph? Pause now. So this is actually a bit of a tough question. These arrows here indicate energy flow. So if energy is flowing from P to Q, the only reason that could be happening is if P is getting eaten by Q, okay? So here Q is a consumer probably. All right, well, so I'm thinking from P to Q. All right, well, this is energy. From P to Q, it looks like P might be a producer because its energy is going to a lot of other organisms. Okay, and we know that saprotrophs are kind of uh, the end of the line. They're taking dead organic matter and recycling it. Not many things are going to eat saprotrophs, so I shouldn't find any energy flowing from a saprotroph. So I know that P cannot be the saprotroph. Okay, same thing with R. R can't be the saprotroph. There's no energy flowing from a saprotroph. Can't be X, can't be Q. The answer here should be T. Do you see how all of the energy in this diagram eventually ends up at T? Well, that's just like all of the nutrients end up with saprotrophs. Next week, we're going to be doing a um, a lab where we're modeling ecological sampling using the quadrat. So right now I want you to get out a sheet of notebook paper. We're going to start this lab. If you need a sheet of notebook paper, there are some in the basket over by the window. Up at the top, don't forget to put your name, and then we're going to title this Litter Lab. 
Next week, we're going to be going out into this practice field out in front of McCaskey, and we're going to divide it into half, the north half and the south half. So some of you are going to be sampling from the north and some of you from the south. And I want you to go ahead and copy down these headings, and we're going to fill these in. Okay, so our question here is, is there a significant difference between the number of pieces of litter on the south side of the field versus the north side of the field? Now, our hypothesis, we're always going to use the null hypothesis, and that is that there is no significant difference. Okay, so we're gonna use an all hypothesis, which always says that there is no significant difference, and we're gonna see if our data shows that to be correct or if that's incorrect. Okay, so our independent variable here is going to be the side of the field. And those are the two things that we're testing, and we're gonna test north versus south. There's no units or uncertainties on there. Okay, and so our dependent variable would be the number, oh, I should write that out all the way, the number of pieces of trash or litter, and there's no units on that. Um, and since we're counting, that'll just be plus or minus one as our uncertainty. And so for our statistical tool, let's think about this. We're going to be uh, taking a bunch of samples from the north and a bunch of samples from the uh, south. And we're going to be seeing if there's a significant difference. For that, we're going to be conducting a t-test to see if those two means, the mean for the north and the mean for the south, are significantly different. Okay, so here's our procedure that you can start copying down. Again, make, probably make a heading for procedure, and we'll want to number these. The numbers got cut off when I converted these into a PDF. Okay, so 10 simple steps here. First, you're going to find a table of random numbers. You can look that up on the iPad, on the calculator. There's lots of different places. Don't worry about that now. You'll just need to find that when we're ready to go outside and do this lab. All right, second thing we're gonna need is the actual total size of the right side of the field versus the left side of the field. So I'll be measuring that. Um, we need to know the size of the field, like the total number of square meters, so that when we take quadrats in each side of the field, we can get a rough idea of how much of the field we've actually sampled. Okay. So you're going to be working in groups. We'll have a couple groups collect data on one side and a couple groups collect data on the other side. So what you'll do within your group is first you're going to start in a random spot on one side of the field. You're going to take a pencil and you're going to spin it. So you'll have a clipboard or something like that. Here's your clipboard. Mm. Okay, something like that. And you're going to take a pencil and spin it around on your clipboard and wherever the pencil stops, that is the direction that you'll walk in. Well, how far are you gonna walk? Well, that's what you're gonna use your random uh, numbers for. So the pencil's for the direction, the random number tells you how many steps to walk. So this is how we're ensuring that we're in random spots within our field. Then you're going to lay your quadrat down in that area. Count the number of pieces of litter that are inside of your quadrat, not touching it, not covered by it, inside the quadrat. You're going to record that in your data table, and you're going to compile the class data. 
Okay, so let's think about what kind of data we're going to collect. Okay, so we are going to have, and I'm going to leave some room at the top, we are going to have the north side of the field and the south side. And I would go ahead and make room for 20 quadrat, okay? So these are quadrat samples. Okay, so we'll have like one, two, three. I want you to do that all the way until you get to 20. And then after you get to 20, okay, and of course you'll need to include all these lines also. Okay, we're going to do a row for the mean. And we're gonna do a row for the standard deviation. Okay, so we're going to get 20 quadrat samples from the north side and find an average and a standard deviation. And we're going to get 20 quadrat samples from the south side, find an average and a standard deviation. And then of course we're going to conduct a t-test, so then we're going to get a p-value from the t-test. And um, we're not going to do this on Excel, I'll show you how we're going to do this. So for now, we can just write this on your notebook paper. Okay, last thing that you're gonna do to get ready for this lab is, well, I don't know. Just make sure that you have everything written down on your lab paper so far. Um, please make sure that you turn in your notes packet. Be careful, there is a question there at the end for you to do, and then I will catch up with you and we'll get this ecological data sampled uh, when I see you next.